This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders lies a remarkable farm, one that is trapped in time, being restored to how it would have been in the reign of James I, the year 1620. Here a unique project is about to take place. Five hand-picked experts are going to run it as it would have been 400 years ago. Working without any modern conveniences, they'll be toiling to make the farm work for a full calendar year. Over the next 12 episodes, we'll be following our team through the months and seasons, from the warmth of summer to the dark depths of winter, as they turn the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. This farm, situated in a Welsh valley, was abandoned in the 19th century. Over 150 years later, a project began to restore it. Over the last 17 years, the foundations of a 17th century farm have been relayed. Although the site is taking shape, there is lots that still needs to be done in order for it to function as a fully working farm. Our team are going to take on the challenge. Although modern health and safety laws mean they can't actually live here, they're going to work here on a daily basis. They'll wear period clothing and cook and eat food from the era. They'll be turning theory into practice, doing everything by hand, using only tools and materials available in the year 1620. A small hill farm like this would usually have been run by a farmer, his wife and children, assisted by some servants and laborers. Following in their footsteps is Stuart Peachy, a historian specializing in the food and farming practices of the period. He's been closely involved with rebuilding the site since the beginning. In theory, we know what we're doing for the next 12 months, but many of these practices haven't been used in Britain for hundreds of years now. It's also the first time on the farm that we've had a full team to run it over a complete calendar year uh, using these original techniques. So there's a lot to find out. Is it really going to work or not? <laughs> no, you are, but you're getting followed through better. Four other experts have been recruited to join Stuart. Historian Ruth Goodman specializes in the clothing and social customs of the era. She's an advisor to the Globe Theatre and has been a consultant on films like Shakespeare in Love. I've done lots of the sort of domestic and social tasks that a farmer's wife would have needed to have done. But what I'm really looking forward to is some of the bigger agricultural things like the year-round care of animals, sheep shearing, a wheat harvest, which I've never really had a chance to try before. Come on, gorgeous. And there are three young archaeologists. Good. Chloe Spencer has the most practical experience of working with animals. I grew up on a farm, so I'm not too worried about working with the animals generally. I'm a little bit apprehensive about working with period breeds in a 17th century setting. Um, I've no idea how they'll react and, and how to work with them, really. So I think it's going to be quite a challenge. Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn, nicknamed Fonz, are going to be supplying much of the heavy labour. They're old friends who've excavated many archaeological sites. I'm really looking forward to throwing myself into these big agricultural projects. We're going to have to be um, ploughing, we're going to have to be shearing the sheep, and at the end of the year, hopefully, we're going to be harvesting. But it's one thing to read about it, it's another thing to be faced with the task of actually having to do it. Ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be a farmer, so this represents a fantastic opportunity for me, but having to try and get this farm to work without modern machinery and using tools from the period, that's a real daunting task. It's September, and after a few days settling in, now the team really have to get to work. This is the month that kicks off the agricultural calendar. The most urgent task is ploughing. They need to get a crop of wheat into the ground if they're going to have anything to harvest next summer. Look at this. Come on, nearly there. As was common for small farms of the period, a team of oxen, Arthur and Lancelot, have been brought in to help. No problem. Their handler is John Johnston. Oxen were the mainstay of a lot of um, farms in the good old days and used to have teams varying from a pair up to eight. 
the, the competition was the horse, but at the end of the day, the horse in Britain wasn't eaten. And in Britain, we still eat oxen, uh, and of course, that was the difference in economics. Ten. I've never actually ploughed before. I mean, I've, I've read a lot about it, and, and certainly this plough looks the part, but you know, I'm really looking forward to this, see how this develops. Do you need a hand there, Martin? No, it's done. How's the plough looking? Not bad. Just back it up a little bit, please. That's it. All right. Get ready, boys. OK. Come on, steady, boys. Just walk on gently. Right. Walk on, boys. Walk Come on. on. Hold up. Come on. Walk Come on. on. Off we go. That's it. Good boys. Come on, boys. Walk on. Walk on. Good boys. Good boys. Right. Good boys. These are English longhorn oxen, and these two are, as you can see, are about, about a tonne apiece, which is a lot fatter than they should be. But they wouldn't let them get too thin because they needed the meat at the end of the day. But Arthur and Lancelot here are about uh, 12 and a half years old, and in theory they would work until they were about 15. Walk on. A bit rocky coming up, boys. Walk on. It's probable that nobody's Walk used on. a plough like this since the 17th century in this country, but we do at least have period diagrams and instructions from which we've been able to rebuild this one. An acre used to be the amount of land a man could plough in a day. So as we've got half an acre here to put down to grain, we should be finished by lunchtime. Come Just come gently now. Just steady now. Steady. The oxen are pulling their weight, but the team are struggling with the plough. Steady. Whoa. 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 Is she clogging or is she? Yeah. Problem is it gets pinched between the... Um... Yeah. Is it worth taking the coulter out? Yeah. I just wonder that. Yeah. Stuart, can I have a mallet, please? Yeah. <clears throat> What's happening, Fonz? Um, it's clogging up between the coulter and the ploughshare, mm -hmm. so I was just going to raise the Put coulter a bit. The coulter, the metal pin, that's supposed to actually do the cutting and the share, well, that divides the earth. But what we're finding is that between the coulter and the share is we're picking up loads of stubble, and that's just bluntening the share, so it's not going anywhere. So what we're going to try first is to remove the coulter out of the equation and just see if the share is enough to cut. Well, whoa. Whoa. Indoors, in the wellhouse, Ruth and Chloe have to master one of the most essential tasks of a 17th century farmer's wife, baking bread. First step is lighting the bread oven. Like most bread ovens 400 years ago, you actually light a fire inside the oven. And then, as it burns, it heats the stones or bricks around the space. And then you can take the fire out and the it'll be the hot stones themselves that do the cooking. Because these are such fine twigs, they're all this waste material, they're really actually springy and difficult to get into the oven. Are we full? Oh, excellent. Yeah. I usually find the best way to get this lit really quickly is to uh, put a handful of hay in under the faggots. We're aiming for a temperature to cook bread. Um, so, you know, if you're on your oven at home, if you've got a dial, you want something like gas mark seven. <laughs> Walk on. Come on, boys. Well, that's the business. Excellent. Good boys. Good boys. Good boys. Ah! OK, so we're not gathering clag anymore, so we're good. That's been the problem, then, I think, isn't it? We're starting to get into the ground at last here, but it's not perfect yet. It should be turning a nice sod on one side only, but at the moment it's just scratching a groove across the ground. But it's progress. All right, OK. While the bread oven warms up, Ruth and Chloe can get on with making up the dough farm like this probably would have been making two or three times a week. Not every family would have had their own bread oven. So often in villages you'd have had a, a, a communal bread oven. You'd make your bread at home and then take it along to the oven to be baked. That's why you prick it and poke it and mark it with D like in that marvellous nursery rhyme. So you know which one's yours. How's yours? Oh, I think I'm about there actually. Yep. If we pop these to rise. Okay, I'll go on a cloth. Yep. Walk on, walk on, on. Go. Go on, boys. Walk Here, on. Good on. Off walk we on. go. Walk on. Get on, Lance. Get on. The ploughing is going on. slower than expected. Hey, At this rate, the team certainly won't be finished by lunchtime. They may be struggling to finish before nightfall. Hey, up there. Go on, hood up. Come on, Lance. You're lagging again, aren't you, old boy? Come on, look. Come around, boys. That's it. Round. You want to get this in position, yeah. Good boys. Walk Using a plough is all about technique. Walk on. As well as maintaining a straight line, they have to make sure the plough drives deep into the soil. Come on, that's Come on, Lance, a lot. Walk on. Come on, Lance. I'm doing a wee bit of plough surfing here because I'm adding extra weight because the uh, ploughshare kept bouncing out. 
but now the two of us putting the weight on it means it's biting and we're getting some pretty good furrows, pretty deep. They look like modern plough furrows. Steady, Arthur, steady. Come on, boys. Walk on. Come on, Lancelot. Good boys. OK, we're coming to turn round. Right, jack out. Whoa. 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 Right, you're out of the way? I'm out of the way. Now that the bread oven's up to temperature, Ruth and Chloe need to rake out the embers. Oh. <laughs> no time to waste doing this. We've got to get the bread in and the door closed before we lose too much of that heat. Right. Three on there? Yeah. Two. It's quite a big bake we're doing this week. Um, okay. I reckon this will probably last us the best part of, sort of half a week or so. Oh, cloud. Steam there. OK. Mm. All right. Once the bread's in, we put the doors up and then you seal it round with a bit of flour and water taste. In comparison to a modern oven, it's an awful lot of faff and work. However, the cooking times are fairly similar to a modern oven and you get a lot of useful cooking heat out of one burn. The heat is in the stones and gradually that temperature's coming down. So as long as you've got the food lined up, in the right sort of order, you can bake a series of things from one burn. Good boys, on, boys. Walk, on. Walk, walk on. Walk on. It's been a hard but walk successful on. day ploughing. By late afternoon, they've done almost half the walk field. On. Walk on. Come across. Walk That's it. Pull them across a bit. It's really going well now. We've quite literally got in the groove. Walk on. Come on. It's fantastic. We've got a, 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 a plough that's been made to period specifications. We've got period species of, of, of oxen and it's and it's really working good boys walk good. thrilling absolutely thrilling walk on hey, hey, hey. come on walk on. Night. Oh. come on come on walk come on hey up walk on. okay Let's see if he's done lovely knock him on the bottom oh <laughs> yeah that's yeah, i think that one sounds right, good of course these loaves got a little bit of ash and charcoal on the bottom of them. So we didn't want to spend too long cleaning the oven out. It would be ridiculous to do so. So the Ooh. bottom crust is always just that little bit dirty. And that's why Ooh. some people in the sort of posher houses would slice them that way instead of that way so that you get an upper crust and a lower crust. And uh, obviously the posh people ate the upper crust and that's why we sometimes Ooh. refer to them as members of the upper crust. Walk on. Ooh, what was that? I'm remarkably impressed, actually, as to how well they've done in these 1600 on, conditions. Please. And once we've got the plough something like right, on, the boys have sort of knuckled in and they really are pulling away quite well here. It must have been fairly hard work, though. I can tell you we haven't done an awful lot, but we're all sweating here, including the oxen. But they do seem to like yoke on, and once the plough's dug in, they will pull away. It's sort of instinctive to them somehow. I'm pleasantly surprised. Come on. You can do it, boys. Come on, walk on. Ho! Come on, Lance. Come on. Eight hours in, and the team are well on the way to finishing the field. It's been tough, but rewarding. Even if they've been ploughing at about half the speed of a 17th century oxen crew. A new morning in the valley. Time for the team to don their specially made period clothes. For Ruth, that means fighting her way into a corset. The palaver. <laughs> this one is um, stiffened with wood down the center. That's this bit here. It's just uh, a bit like a wooden ruler. And then the rest of it is stiffened with bents, which are just sort of reeds. Sometimes these were like removable and they were carved with sort of, because it's next to your heart with sort of love things, it might be something that a sweetheart would give you. And, and there is one really nice little um, one that survives, that's got written down it, uh, to my dear sister, and don't break this one. <laughs> so hot, don't they? A lot of hot down in the beach. Like labourers of the time, Alex and Fonz are kitted out in woolen breeches. We're just getting used to the breeches now. Although well, I'm finding mine a little hot, to be honest. They're linen lined and then made of wool, so in this warm September, I find it does get a little bit, bit sweaty in there. It's a little bit strange wearing um, half-length trousers the whole time, but if they're full length, you rarely wash woolens and they just get covered in dirt. Yeah, so they do have their, their Res plus points. Yeah, socks and shoes, just easier to wash. You can just take them off and bang, it's done.
This shirt, it's a linen shirt, it's absolutely enormous. That's the forehead cloth. It's always the first workout of the day, trying to get into one's doublet. It's a bit of a palaver getting dressed. <laughs> Still, ready for action now. One of Chloe's daily tasks is mucking out the farm's period porkers. Hello, piggy piggies. Are you happy piggies? <laughs> Come on, other way. Come on, boys. The breed of pig we've got here is a World War Tamworth cross, which is about the closest you can get to a 17th century pig. They're different from modern pigs in that they're, they're a darker colour, this sort of rich dark brown, with a wiry coat. Modern pigs are almost bald and, and pink, and they can get easily sunburned. Well, these guys, they're used to being out all the time. I'm just learning about mucking out pigs. It's a new one for me, I have to say, and probably the worst smelling animal I've ever had to do. But it's funny what people say, pigs don't sleep in their own mess. They really don't. They've left all the muck and mess at the front of the pen. And where they're all lying down at the back, it's still nice and clean. September would have been the time to bring in the first of the apple harvest. Stewart's preparing refreshments for a long day ahead. This farmhouse began life as a medieval longhouse. So originally you'd have had cattle at that end and the residents living cheek by jowl with them down here. But like many English farmhouses, it was upgraded in late Tudor times so that instead of the cow shed, you now had a grain barn at the end and you no longer had the waft of excrement around you as you were sitting in your living quarters. The very hub of the farmhouse was the hall and that in turn centred around the great fireplace. Here the women would have cooked, the men would have come in to join them for the evening meals and all of them would have sat around the fire socialising in the evening, drinking their strong beer at the end of the day. It was very much the living room within which all social and domestic activities took place. To help bring in the apples, Chloe is going to press the valley's workhorse into service. This is Blackthorn. She's an ex-pit pony. She's actually a fell horse, which is not local, it's from up in Yorkshire. Um, short, stubby legs, which is ideally suited to this kind of work. Stand. I've only known Blackthorn a short while, and I can see already she's got a hell of a temper on her. She's been dancing around on the end of this rope, so I think we're going to have a bit of a problem on our hands there. Not only is it going to be a challenge getting her fit again, but also getting the boys working with her. It's my turn to uh, light the fires this morning. And unfortunately, it's not a simple case of flicking a switch or even striking a match. Now, back in the uh, 17th century, they've used a flint and a steel. doesn't always work that quickly. But for me, thankfully this morning, this is going to be a relatively easy job. This is actually quite similar to a modern lighter. A modern lighter has a flint and it also has a steel. And you roll the flint across the steel. Instead of gas, we've got a little bit of tinder, which is um, basically linen that's been burnt. And that lights the straw. And hopefully that, that faggot's starting to take. And now we have a fire. Excellent. Autumn was a crucial time for bringing in fruit crops such as apples. They'd be carefully stored to provide an extra food supply for the winter ahead. I can tell they're ripe. Partly this tree's got quite a few that are already rotten on it. Uh, it's a characteristic of the Cornish aromatic. We've got quite a few windfalls on the ground and... and if we bite in, you can see we've got really dark black pips inside there. And that's another sign that it's fully ripe and ready to go. Oh, that's a lovely taste. What type of tree will we get that? 
Even with Blackthorn's help, it's going to take several trips to the orchards to bring in all the apples. Some things never change. 400 years ago, the end of a long day marked a chance to relax and enjoy a few beers. It is tiring. I don't think it is as tiring as I thought it was going to be. Um, I mean, it's just a case of once you get used to it, you get into that routine. I'm certainly noticing that I've become a lot fitter. If you're out doing a job all day and you kind of say to yourself, I must get to that point by the end of the day, and you're just invigorated, right? and I don't know whether that's the experience, whether that's something that they would have felt back, you know, all those many years ago, but for me, I find that very kind of... It's a bit of a buzz, really. I think the biggest surprise for me is how easy it's been to actually just absorb yourself into the life. You find yourself just taking to it as, like, second nature. You just forget. I mean, you really do forget things like TV and rush hour traffic and all that kind of just painstaking part of modern day life. How are you getting on? I'm dry. Me too. A fresh day on the farm means Alex and Stuart can start sowing the freshly ploughed fields with wheat. It's their main crop. They need to make sure it's well established before the winter frosts come. What we're doing at the moment is broadcasting the seed, throwing it evenly right across the field here. And the trick and skill for the farmer on this is to get an even cover, otherwise you're going to waste a lot of your seed corn. William Fitzherbert, he's a chap who wrote a, a farming manual back in the 17th century, and he describes broadcast sowing. He says you put the left foot forward and sow with the right hand, and then the right foot forward and sow with the left. But the problem I'm having is my left arm doesn't seem to be working. I'm just dropping it on the floor, so I'm having to resort to just using my right hand. So I'm sowing with a bit of a kind of backhand technique this way and a, a forehand technique this way, much, very much like table tennis, which I'm notoriously bad at. Pigeon was a common farm dish in September. With fields freshly sown, rather than let pigeons eat the seed, farmers ate the pigeons. And unfortunately, they don't come oven ready. So I've got the job of plucking them and then gutting them. This is remarkably easy. The feathers just are peeling away from the skin. I've only been here for, what, three weeks? And already I'm getting a very good idea of what it must have been like to be living back in the 17th century. Just the fact that you can't come in from the fields and slam something in the oven. You've actually got to pluck your birds. You've got to knead and bake your bread. Everything just takes so much time. Oh! Hang up beautifully. There she goes. Ah. Stuart and Alex are going to use a hawthorn branch to make a rustic harrow to rake over their newly sown wheat seed. Moment of truth. Ready? To make sure the hawthorn spikes knock down the furrows, they've tied a log on the back to add some weight. It's the first real test for Blackthorn. What a good mare. Oh, you know what you're doing, don't you? Come on. Walk on. September is a great month for food. There's loads of things available. We're going to have some apple fritters today with the apples that we picked out in the orchard. And farm gardens 400 years ago were full of produce at this time of year. After hours of plucking, Fonz's pigeons are now ready for the pot. The recipe we're following is about 400 years old and comes from an English woman's handwritten personal um, book that... Um, Funnily enough, passed into the ownership of the Washington family, and George Washington's wife owned it. It seems to have come down her side of the family rather than his. To boil pigeons with puddings. When your pigeons are clean dressed, boil them in water and salt. So if you want to pop those in, Fonz, and um, give it a couple of pinches of salt. Then it says, then take for the pudding some grated bread, a little flour, three or four eggs, and a little cream. Take marrow and or beef suet. I think I'm going to use butter, actually, instead. Mace, nutmeg and cinnamon to your taste and a little sack. Oh, you're a strong chap. <laughs> there you go, Fonz. Thank you. 
Before I came to work on the farm, I thought food from the 17th century was going to be tasteless. Sort of boiled carrots, brains, stewed turnip. But I've been pleasantly surprised. The food has been fantastic. The recipe requires that the dumplings be wound up in a piece of cloth, tied into sections, and then boiled over the fire. The rustic harrow they're using is based on one depicted in a period illustration. Looking at it, I think we might have done better if we put a second log back towards the, the tail end to flatten out the back of the bush. But we're getting a reasonable sweep. That might just broaden out how much we do. The trick now is going to be steering the horse, because we should be working systematically from side to side of the field. But that's going to come with a bit of practice. Puppy. I can't get to walk in a straight line, Chloe. Hang on. Let me take her. We're using another recipe out of this book, entitled To Stew a Dish of Mushrooms. They're a marvellous free food at this time of year, mushrooms, although quite a lot of people in the 17th century were very suspicious of fungi in general. On the other hand, some people thought that they were an aphrodisiac, so... Good girl! A couple of hours in, and they're slowly getting to grips with harrowing. It needs doing quickly to prevent any birds scoffing their seed. Use your elbow, put your elbow against her shoulder and, and keep leading. That's it. She needs to do that to get the yeah. momentum up. I don't have any experience of this, so it's a bit of a learning curve, very steep learning curve for me. But it seems to be working okay. She's not too bothered by it. And Alex is doing really well. Indoors, supper's nearly ready. The apple fritters are sizzling nicely. Good evening. Good evening. The team's first month on the farm has gone well. Their first major tests, ploughing, sowing and harrowing, are done. How am I doing with the horse then? OK? She's, yeah, getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. Well, you've got another 11 months <laughs> to prime me. God. <laughs> Ooh, it comes from these birds. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Oh, they're dripping. You've got enough room. Just a bit. Oh, look at that. One thing that farmhouse tables still lacked at the time were forks. They were something new to Britain, imported from Italy and used only by the gentry. Ordinary folk had to make do with knives, spoons, and their hands. There we go, look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put all the dumplings forks. Can you plate over? Yes. Delicious. That pigeon is fantastic. No, the, the time has just flown by. We have sort of slipped into things quite easily here. Uh, maybe I'm speaking too soon. We do have the winter. <laughs> today, we don't maybe you're speaking for yourself. <laughs> It'll be a year before Stuart, no, Ruth, it. Alex, yeah. Chloe and Fonz find out how well their wheat crop has done. In the meantime, they'll have plenty to get on with. Next time in the valley, it's October. Time to get the pigs out into the woods. Get those pigs under control. <laughs> the team have to bring in the pears and put them into store. And there's a cow shed to be built. <laughs>